The following program was previously streamed live. Visit sleepapnea.org to get more videos, audio, and blog content. Also, you can register at sleepapnea.org to be included in the conversation, and updated whenever new programs are available. It's all free. Thanks for joining us, and enjoy. Good afternoon, and welcome back to the ASAA sleepapnea.org speaker series. And we are honored and humbled today to have one of our board members, our community education leaders, and someone who's got a history inside the sleep field that uh, goes before my time. And uh, hopefully we can talk about these two fine uh, gentlemen who've been uh, so important in both of our lives. So please welcome uh, Ms. Teresa Schumard. So how are you doing, Teresa? I'm doing fine. And you really made me sound old, so I don't know. (laughs) Well, I kind of am, but it's all right. Uh, I'll let you I think we're all a lot older these days, Teresa. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, and you know, we we lost we lost Dr. C. G. last year, almost a year now, and now last week we lost Dr. Dement. And f- as far as sleep medicine goes, they they were our rock stars. And I'm, I'm really sad. I mean, you, we knew, I mean, Dr. Dement being 91 years old, we knew that this day was coming, but uh, so sad. What it's, a great it's man. A, it's a sad day in the course of one year. I was just thinking about it. We lost, we lost Dr. Gimito last year. And this past week, we lost Dr. Dement. And, you know, when, I, when, it, when we lost Dr. Gimito last year, this is actually the one-year anniversary. I had my last intervention, which was the transpalatal uh, distraction to expand my mouth. So me, I crossed, I crossed paths with Dr. Gimeno in the hospital uh, mm-hmm. with about two weeks before before he passed. And then about a couple of months later, and we're going to see this, this video that I did, we sat down and, and interviewed all the members of, of his Stanford sleep clinic over all those years and, you know, different RPSGTs and some of the original doctors and some of the different people throughout the years. And, and then Boom, that happened, you know, coincidentally yeah. and spookily enough, we happened to record Dr. Dement's last interview. I know. How and lucky <coughs> that we got that. I'm, I'm, I'm humbled and thrilled that we got it, but, you know, it's like he passed last week, and we're coming up on CG's anniversary, and it's like it's, we're, and it's, we just had Father's Day, and, and this is the one-year anniversary of my surgery. And then, it, then the other sort of aha moment for me was, Oh my God! This is the 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 anniversary of me losing my father eighteen years ago. Oh. Which is, you know, if but without Dement and without Doctor Gimeno and without me reading The Promise of Sleep on a plane, I would have never gotten from Dement to Gimeno to be able for us yeah. to have this conversation today. Yeah, yeah. So, it, yeah, that, there's always things happen for a reason. I think you know, and uh, that's probably that was probably it for you, but. A lot of sadness goes with this because they were, I mean, they, they pulled this discipline out of the, out of nowhere, really. I mean, nobody was talking about sleep. Everybody in medicine kind of made fun of the sleep science people. Like they were like weird science and, oh, they're in a sleep lab watching you. And, you know, it just was, it was like a lot of cracking of jokes. Like we would go, I remember one time we were in Nashville or somewhere. Yeah, it was Nashville because it was the Opryland Hotel. And that that during that time during the sleep meeting there was a some other convention going on and uh they were making jokes cracking jokes about don't go by over there because they're all sleeping you know don't go by you know salon b or whatever it was you know that that, that like, was my that that was my first introduction into the sleep field was that was the big punchline is nobody gets any sleep at the sleep meetings <laughs> That's uh, right. But before we get into the stories, let's 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 show everybody this video, and then we okay. can reminisce about yeah. about Doctor Dement and CG and, and the history of sleep. A select amount of us may have hypertension. A select amount of us may have diabetes or heart disease. But one thing that connects us, every single human being in this planet, is sleep.
no end shall come to the good that he has done. It was like I had met Yoda. I walked in and I saw him and I was like, starstruck. Like he's like a rock star, like this dude is just. He's a tour de force. I would say he can be intimidating at the beginning. He's a little mischievous too. He always said that you are the future. He loved humans, he loved people, he loved, uh, he loved uh, wine. <laughs> Everybody knows that he is a wine connoisseur. Oh boy, I have really come to the right department. <laughs> well, he was the first one there and the last one to leave. I couldn't believe how much he loved sleep. I think he may have loved it more than he loved any other person. I've never seen anything like that in the realm of medicine. I always felt very confident that fellows who came to Stanford would get the, the very best uh, from Chris John, who is just a great mentor. He, probably more than anyone else, uh, helped us understand what sleep apnea is and established it as part of, of medicine. Most importantly, his work was in trying to bring our attention to issues of sleep as early on in the lifespan as possible. His dedication to understanding sleep disorders in children is unmatched. I was asked by the Nobel Committee to nominate him for a Nobel Prize in 2002. He, he had that kind of international reputation. It was, it was really about helping everybody who came through, no matter what status they were, no matter you know, what was going on, and learning more to be able to help them even further. And people came from all over the place to be able to um, be seen by CG. And beyond a legend, he had a passion for his patients. He treated each one with such passion and caring. You know, it was like this, this um, flurry of energy, um, but it was always a passionate um, connection to the patients and the staff and the fellows. He loved the fellows. What is important is the zest with which he imparts information. I haven't met anybody who didn't like CG. When he first met me, he looks at me and he says, Bill, he says, you have it. And I said, I have what? He said, you have sleep apnea. I said, no, I don't. He said, yes, you do. Obviously, Friday afternoons, if you ask any fellow, were one of the best times we would bond have wine and cheese and hang out and bond and um, just very special moments that you know we all will look back and uh, cherish. He's the father of sleep medicine and he expects that the rest of the of the of our generation will continue to further advance sleep medicine. Uh, Christian Gumino's legacy is going to be us and how many of us uh, took so much from him and hopefully gave back so much to him throughout his life. Well, I think his legacy is going to be the discovery and naming of obstructive sleep apnea, uh, of rapid eye movements. I don't think there are going to be very many people that could follow in his footsteps because he's just, he was larger than life. He just had this. Um, excitement and passion about sleep that, um, you know, touched us all. His legacy will create a wave of people discovering things about sleep that actually will exponentially change how we treat sleep, how we look at it, and how we basically create a worldwide awareness for it. I think there's a lot of undiagnosed people and what he started, people, everyone that he's taught, all his students are just going to carry that information forward and hopefully help a bunch of people get better sleep. His legacy will be the journal that uh, he and Bill Demand started. In the future, the surgeons will develop more and more uh, procedures that will literally cure the illness. What do you hope is going to happen in the next five to ten years? That people will see more children and that people will see them will see and understand that we must give children an opportunity to sleep that sleep is, a, is as an important function in our life as daytime functioning. 
Sleep is the yin to the yang of our daylight functioning. Well, thank you to our team at sleepapnea.org for really putting together and taking the time to go through all the still photos uh, that the, the Stanford Sleep Clinic was so nice to, to collect for us last year at the tribute uh, dinner for Dr. Gimeno. A man that wrote, you know, 800 papers over a 50-year period, trained over 90 fellows directly, individually. You can imagine how many other people have been connected by these two men and what they created in, in Palo Alto and Redwood City in the early 70s. And, you know, I'll just say one other thing is, you know, we, we, we have a, a past video that we recorded with uh, Dr. Gimeno uh, a couple of years ago talking about the Friday Clinic, which was the, his multidisciplinary clinic that uh, Dr. Patel, one of the, the his young fellows, uh, uh, alluded to earlier is that every Friday that all the different disciplinaries, all the different young fellows from whatever walk of life that they're coming, whether it's pulmonology, surgery, and ENT, or behavioral and psych, they'd come to the clinic and they would and they'd meet with the sleep apnea patients so that the sleep apnea patients didn't have to go meet with five different specialists. All five different specialists were there at once to discuss their case. And, and if you think about it, it wasn't a moneymaker for the hospital because it's not fitting the business model, but who is it best helping was the patients and their outcomes. And, and because of that Stanford sleep, they were so innovating that you had that kind of experience that I, as a patient, when I went through that experience, I got to meet with the allergist, the psychotherapist, the GI doctor, the dentist, whoever the right appropriate person was that I was working on to fix my care and my intervention. And then that eventually of my daughters and family. And that, and that came from what these guys created out at Stanford and Palo Alto that, that many years ago and before my time. Well, you know, a lot of those young fellows were so admiring of the whole the whole thing, the whole sleep thing. Um, a lot of them were in the sleep and dreams class yeah. that was the most popular class at Stanford uh, that Dr. Dement taught. So a lot of those kids came over and would eventually be fellows, which was awesome so which, was, which was really right cool there. what was really cool about this the sleep and dreams class which was the most popular freshman class for those in the know and those in not know for stanford freshmen and it started out as you know obviously you wanted you know you needed a light easy class but it became a class that everyone went to and whether they were laughing or joking or sleeping at the end of the day, they still remember this class 30, 40 years later. They don't remember all their other classes because it had that much of a profound effect on them. But what was... And you know, a lot of people don't even realize that Dr. Demant used to let them sleep in class. That was the only class they would ever be in. And they, there was a sleeping section and, and then there was the awake section. So I thought, <laughs> I thought that was amazing. He, he, he was a teacher after my own heart. The, the other thing I always <laughs> found amazing was that... You know, one the fellow's job when they were going through the clinic and training under Dr. Gimeno and Dr. Dement is they had to give, teach one of the awake classes every month. Stanford had the Stanford Awake Group. So for 10 years, once a month for, you know, 12, 12 sessions a year, there was a fellow teaching in a st the, 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 the local Stanford Awake community about what was going on with their CPAP or their behavior or, or their, you know, what's the latest in, in, in innovation. So, you know, because of Dr. Dement and because of Dr. Gimeno, uh, we had this 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 model for how to build out awake, but you know, now that we're in this new COVID area, you know, our patients aren't going to the Stanford clinics. They're not going to their local clinics. So it's taking that model and, and that that education, that wisdom that that came out of these two men who created a field. I mean, Dr. Zarconi said, I think it was 2002, and I'm, I mean that's the year my dad died. He was nominating CG for a, for a Nobel Nobel Prize for creating a field that wasn't here. I mean, it's, it's, this is a new field. So you can see there's, there's a Wild West aspect to it. And, you know. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Uh, it, 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 the, the knowledge that they were gaining as they were doing experimental work in the first sleep lab, which was at Stanford, uh, was just, it was just uncovering a lot of things that 
you know, later down the line made a lot of sense. You know, once, for instance, Pickwickian syndrome was, was one thing that Dr. C.G. brought to Stanford and kept telling everybody, look, there's this Pickwickian syndrome. It's, it's the Charles Dickens, the Charles Dickens uh, book. And it's, it's all about Joe, the fat boy. And he falls asleep even when he's standing up was the, was the quote. And that took, actually, it took a lot of, uh, you know, convincing later on because that's where people first started understanding sleep apnea was for uh, the overweight person. And they found out later that that was just sad. It was a camouflage, you know, for what, for what was really going on in the thin part. They, they had a, they had several people come in that were thin and they had it and they were like, wait a minute. So, yeah. I, I always remember, and you know, I'm looking at, at CG in my in my my screen with uh, over my shoulder. He's you know one of our awake angels. Yeah. <laughs> you know, especially especially in, in this in this era and this time that we're going through. Uh, you know, he's like, listen, this has been around before. You know, before there was electricity, that you know people were snoring in their sleep. Shakespeare was identifying it, Pickwickian, um, but it wasn't until that these guys correlated this issue that was going on consciously in our sleep. While our eyes were closed, uh, they didn't until they connected it to the cardiovascular system. It wasn't taken serious. People laughed at it. It was the 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 the, the honeymooners, the Jackie Gleason, the Homer Simpson, the Peter Griffin character. Uh, right. And now we're realizing the obesity is really that's it's a result of the the sleep disorder breathing and that skinny people. I used to tell my people, my little two year old daughter wasn't obese. She had my face. You know, yeah, it's, it's exactly. It's, it's, so it's 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 getting that education and awareness out to our our members in our community. I mean, these guys, these gentlemen, created an amazing field. It's new, uh, and I think one of the things you highlighted is that is that the, the man had the foresight to go over to Europe. He was open to the way other worlds were do, teaching, uh, thinking, uh, and he brought him over. Um, we can get into the turf battles and the war battles that are going on inside this field that have gone on in the past and in the in the future. But the truth of the matter, we have a, a, a talk we're doing with the, our, our fellow patient ag, uh, advocacy organizations in Australia, in Europe, uh, at the end of the week that we're going to be doing. And it's, you know, we're learning from them what's going on, especially in light of, you know, not us as patients not being able to believe everything we see on TV or read in the papers about what's going on with their healthcare systems, what they're getting right. Sleep used to be a family. I mean, the world was our family. And in the beginning, we did not differentiate if people were from Europe, Asia, wherever. I mean, everybody everybody was close. Everybody got together. Everybody. I mean, we didn't have a computer to email people. I mean, when it came, that really changed things for us. Otherwise, you had to call them over there, which could be quite expensive. But, you know, well, in the it, beginning... It, it, it's funny you say that now because we were just talking about that earlier. It's, you know, it's the whole telehealth and, and everyone's going towards that where it was the adjunct. And now, you know, even the field and the professionals are learning, we have to use this technology. Our patients want to talk to us and they should be talking to us after they've been evaluated and we've, we've, we've used our hands, our eyes and our ears and listened to their heart and their breathing. Uh, there, this, this, this technology is going to improve our patients' ex experience. They're going to get better adherence. Uh, they're not going to need to spend an hour driving in the car and an hour coming back and waiting and being sleep deprived and putting other people at risk. Oh, absolutely. And you know? everything is so modern now. I mean, do you realize when I was first a sleep tech that we used to, sleep techs would call each other on the phone, like you would call Ohio or California or wherever and talk to your your peers because something was going wrong with a, a reading or a wire or a tracing and you didn't know how, what to do you didn't know how to fit and that's how we helped each other I mean that is a true story <laughs> and when you wanted to learn how to be a sleep tech you would go I remember it well I'd, I'd ask different ones in my geographical area could I come and you know watch your sleep studies with you and everybody was so generous back then there was no competition you know when we launched our uh, our pilot sleep apnea or sleep health uh, apple research kit study four or five years ago i remember after we launched it in the first 24 hours we were blown away because 
we knew how many people that had come in and had signed up in that 24 hours. But what we weren't considering, because we, you know, we were only it was only offered to American uh, citizens uh, through an institutional review board. But what we had forgotten about is that you had Americans living abroad in every time zone in the world, so that within those 24 hours, we literally had American participants in our study in every time zone in the world. So we could start start now looking at all of their sleep over a course of a day and how that's a- affecting what's going on 12 hours behind them or 12 hours in front of them. And then when we start to realize that this is all connected, the organs are connected, the systems are connected, that we can start to look at the disease, sleep apnea, which is what Dr. Dement and, 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 and Dr. Gimeno, you know, identified at such an early on, but also this daytime alertness and this daytime functioning that's happening incrementally as a result of all these people that are walking around sleep deprived, where drowsiness is a red alert. But if we get that education, that awareness out to the moms, the grandmas about how we can prevent this drowsiness and this alertness now, we can change the course of a lot of people's lives and, and, and mitigate the comorbidities and improve the, the outcomes uh, and, 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 and make the, the quality of life at home better for, for the family, for the relationship with the parents, uh, with the child, for the child to grow and, 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 and thrive and not have a failure to thrive. Um, there's, there's, there's a lot to what these two gentlemen, to the world that they opened up. Uh, and, and, you know, it's normal in any field, in any world, uh, for, for, for there to be turf battles. But when you think about it, when everyone sleeps, there's plenty for everyone to do. And our job as a patient organization and as board members of American Sleep Apnea uh, Association is to make sure that our patients have the best information, the most up-to-date information from all the disciplines, all the different interventions, what's the best things that can work for them and or their family and or their caregiver and or their employees. Uh, and we sort of are taking ourselves out of this infighting, whether it's testing or what the right intervention is. And, and we're going to share this knowledge and, and point to this unbiased data that we've been collecting over the last couple of years with the FDA, whether it's our awake sleep apnea survey or our four years worth of sleep health objective data that we, co- we collected with the Apple Pilot and the passive data from, from the watches. Uh, any of the overlap data that we're studying with the CPAP data that we did with the COPD Foundation. And, and we're going to work with the FDA and NEST and, 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 the, and the payers and Anthem and Optum and, and, and PISA and the Children's Hospital. We have pilots set up with them to start looking at all this stuff as a whole. What's in the patient's best interest? What are the, they, they like to use you know, terms, PROs, patient reported outcomes. We don't care about adherence. We care about, is your life better? Were you able to get out of bed? Were you a nicer person? You have a better relationship with your family. Um, were you not needing to self-medicate as much? Uh, were you a more positive, productive influence on society? Um, if your mentally outlook is better, or are or, 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 or you are you mentally more prepared to deal with the pandemic that we're going through with the COVID era right now? Because we're physically isolated from so much. We're physically isolated, but we don't have to be socially isolated. You know, so we've we've got a lot of mental health and confinement issues that are that are coming out as a result of this. I'll come up there, Teresa. <laughs> You're doing fine. Um, you know, you you bring up a very good point. I mean, that's all advocacy, and that's what we're about. And our best teacher was Dr. Dement. I mean. The, I mean, previous to all advocacy work, Wake Up America was the was the uh, initiative. Uh, the you know they had these studies and experiments that they had done that described these huge physical ails, but it actually camouflaged a, a bigger societal problem that Americans don't get enough sleep. And, you know, we as Americans, whoa, I can go on four hours sleep. I don't, you know, it's like they wore a badge of honor for, you know, something that's so dangerous. So that's where Wake Up America came from and the great American sleepwalk and all the things that that he fought for uh, to then, you know, increase the awareness of the horrors of sleep deprivation. For instance, the Exxon Valdez, the Challenger accident, Chernobyl, 
Three Mile Island. All those led up to to Wake Up America. Uh, and you know, one of the one of the biggest accidents, and, and this is how I you know I learned about Doctor Dement is when was when my daughter was one years old, and I'd, I'd only been treated for about six months at that point, and I started becoming my own advocate and I'm reading the promise of sleep and I'm on a plane ride home from Miami back to California. And this is after I just had an allergic reaction to an epidural injection and I wound up in anaphylactic shock and, you know, we were confused what's going on. They figured out a sleep apnea, but you're having all these other central nervous system issues and fibromyalgia and your body's not making sense to you. You know, I was like, I, I got to go home and, you know, my, 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 my top young neurologist who actually had trained at Stanford, his name was Michael Wang, he worked for uh, uh, Barth Green, who's the famous neurospine, uh, the Miami Project to Cure Paralysis, Mark Bonacani's doctor. Michael Wang said to me, he goes, listen, he goes, injury, there's no doubt about it, but you need to go home and start over. Get off the meds, get off these things that are, that are confusing your decision making right now. And, you know, when I got on that plane and I'm reading, and I don't know what chapter it was, and, and they're talking about the FAA flight and the American Airlines flight that flew into a mountain in Colombia in 1995, you know, I about dropped the book. And not because it's, of course, that's a horrendous story, but I know that flight. That's the flight of my, my, my best friend's wife was on, on the plane with a friend of ours. She got off from Boston to Miami. He stayed on the flight, went from, from Miami to, to Bogota. Now, that kid that I'm talking about, that's the kid who was the valedictorian of my high school class who spoke English as a second language. He's the straight-A kid. He's the kid six months away from graduating Harvard, and he dies because of pilot sleep deprivation, that the FAA uses this exact black box transcript that Dr. Dement is referring to in his book. And I, and I almost I drove, drove through gas stations at, at 60 miles an hour and walked away. And, but this kid died because of, and it's like, this is how this was all interconnected to me. So I'm reading Dr. Dement's book. And I'm like, when I got back out to California, Dr. Dement said one thing, you need to go to Christian Gimeno in his book. That's the man who knows what's going on. And, and walking into that man's room nine years ago, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. My, you know, I teared. And, you know, and it changed my life. And then I remember taking my daughter in there a year later. Uh, you know, me, I, I, this whole experience happened when Mia was one. She was diagnosed a year later. He wa and I walked her in there at two years old. And he said, oh, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And as I, and as I, at that point, I was like, wow. We have a question from, um, uh, from, from someone that uh, wondering how common it is for sleep to be deprived, uh, you know, for pilots and, and people that are in those vigilance type situations. And I really don't have the statistics in front of me. I mean, it changes all the time. I used to be able to cite it, you know, when we were doing all these campaigns, but I'll just give you an anecdotal personal story. I was sitting in an airport waiting for my flight in the, in the coffee shop and a pilot was sitting there and we struck up a conversation and I said, let me ask you, if you are too tired, do you still have to fly? I mean, are you like, say you really need a nap, you know, which every human being sometimes needs a nap. And I said, what happens? You know, can you just say I'm too tired and I can't go? And he said, oh, no. He said, that would not go over well. I said, so you mean to tell me if you're sleepy, you still have to drive me on the plane? And he said, yes. And that, I told everybody I knew I was so mad, <laughs> you know. Well, but, but before we even get into hypotheticals, let's, let's talk about what we do know scientifically, facts-wise, Teresa. The National Cancer Institute, the NCI, is known for over 10 years that shift work, anybody working shift work, Nighttime workers have a much higher direct pathway to having cancer as a carcinogen because of circadian rhythm uh, disruption. Mm -hmm. So just that alone, we know there are fly pilots flying across time zones at weird hours that that alone makes them a candidate for, for a lot of other health issues. Are there pilots? Are there bus drivers? Are there school bus drivers? Are there, are there are transportation drivers? Are there train operators? Are there boat captains? Yes. It's not how tired you are. It's how tired you are when you drive. Just like the, the famous, it's not how much you, you drink when you drive. It's how tired you are when you drink when you drive is the bigger magnifying component to the, the, to the factor. Because driving tired 
is driving drunk. Pretty much. Pretty much. Um, I mean, they did a lot of, uh, Dement especially did a lot of work to raise awareness of drowsy driving and, you know, trying to get people to understand that it was, you know, it was a, they were operating a machine. I mean, they were they you could kill people from that. Um, I, I I think Haskell Wexler did a movie called Who Needs Sleep about the the guys working yes. in the film industry. Haskell yes. was a famous cinematographer and talking about mm -hmm. how these guys would work eighteen hour shifts and then do an hour two hour drive back back in from the desert back into Southern California and how many people have died from accidents and car accidents over the years. Uh, we can assume what happened. Uh, it's, th there's no doubt. I mean, Kevin Bradley talked about it at our summit about being a frontline, uh, uh, nurse and, you know, for the transplant teams, he'd be doing a 24 hour term and then couldn't even remember how he drove home, how he had to learn to get disciplined to, you know, and, and his employee said, no, you get a hotel room, you get a cab, you know, we don't want you driving, uh, while you don't even know what's going on. Um, but yeah, I mean, everyone needs sleep, apnea or not, they need sleep. But I remember sitting in Dr. Dement's office with him one time and we were talking about, you know, what if, what if something happens? I mean, what, would it not be just horrific if one of the sleep techs fell asleep at the wheel on the way home in the morning and there was a, a you know, fatality? He said that, he said, I pray that that never happens, but it could. And, you know, well, Teresa, let me stop you there. At a, at, at, let me stop you there at a hard stop because that, that's my fear is I was at 27 years old and I drove through a gas station. I blacked out. My best friend's not in the car. He throws the car in the park. We missed the light pole. He, he, he caught us. I then went to every see every doctor. And this is, man, this is almost 20 years ago. Uh, you know, and even 20 years ago, when you're talking about Vic Sarconi's nominating Christian for a Nobel, the young newly trained clinicians or the clinicians that I was seeing in Miami Beach, not in a third world country, but in a pretty nice place to live and grow up. They didn't know what they were looking at because I didn't fit the mold. I wasn't big enough, fat, and obese. I was skinny. I was a young man, and they just young. thought you're mm -hmm. just you know you're young and dumb. You know you're, you're tired. Slow down. You know blah 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 blah. It was, and I went, it was described as middle aged men yeah. disease. You know, and you weren't any of those. So you know you were still a kid. So that that's why I think it's the the amazing work that the men did from the public advocacy and what he did on the hill and with the, the NIH and, and with the government and getting them aware about sleep and just the word sleep and its its role in all of these things. But I'll come back to what CG left us. CG left us the blueprint and the pathway to reverse this disease. Nobody should ever get to sleep at me. It's the end of the road. This sleep disorder breathing is, 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 is in the children. We can train the moms. We can train the, the, the moms after and postpartum what's going on. These kids that are, that are popping for ADD or not having their tonsils and adenoids. Uh, we can prevent a lot of this major chronic alertness and drowsiness stuff from affecting our society. Uh, right now, we, you know, we're, we're at home, we're confined, our sleeping rhythms are off, but we could also use this as a time to learn about our sleep and to screen for the, for the snoring and the apnea uh, and maybe start to do something about it. Absolutely. So, you know, coming up on uh, the one-year anniversary of my own surgery, the one-year uh, anniversary of CG's passing and, 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 you know, us just being able to show, you know, Dr. Dement's last interview that he was so kind to sit down for us and share some words about CG and in light of his passing uh, and in light of this being Father's Day, um, you know, just, we just, we, we, we hope for all our, our family, all our caregivers, all our, 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 our patients and all those patients that are diagnosed and, and struggling and all the ones that are undiagnosed and don't even know this that find themselves in other clinics that, uh, that, uh, we assure you that once you, you get some help and get the sleep under control, you're going to be able to manage a lot of other aspects of your life. And, and in the past that, that Dr. DeBent and Dr. Gimeno both laid out for us, uh, almost 50 years ago today is, uh, just, just, we're just getting started with this and we look forward to what the next 50 years can bring. You know, we have a lot of this information on our website at sleepapnea.org. We hope that you go there and we have a join. It's not that you have to pay to join, but I mean, there's a join there and that way you would get, 
you know, information from us and be connected in with your tribe because we're all patients here and uh, we love to have you um, come and visit. We have a forum over there. We have a uh, support group on Facebook. We're doing a lot more virtual work these days, obviously. We used to have, uh, you know, the face-to-face -face awake groups, but I, I think that those will probably be, you know, few and far between as we move forward past COVID. And uh, geographically, it's, it's sometimes hard for people in rural areas to get to those. So, we're trying to do things as virtually as possible and hope that uh, I, I think, everybody... I think that. I think that's a good note to take us out on, Teresa. You know, it's, it's, it, it was sort of our aha moment of a year or two ago when we realized that, that, that awake is not just for sleep apnea. Awake is for everyone, alert, well, and keep being energetic, right. whether you that's have right. sleep apnea or a caregiver or a patient. You know, just, just, just being alert is important, as Dr. Dement said. You know, drowsiness is red alert. Um, but with that being said, you know, as we move in this new COVID area and we're not in person, we invite people, come to us, come to our forum, come to our groups, look at our videos, help us improve what, what we're offering. Uh, we're not asking for money uh, from our patients. We can join. We, we do not sell your data. We do not share it. Uh, other companies come to us. They, they query it. Uh, we could run focus groups for them, but only if we feel it's patient powered and patient uh, in our best interests. Uh, we're not married to anyone and we're not industry shill. Um, so if you have any questions, come to sleepatme.org, uh, get some sleep, and until next time, good night and good luck. Have a good weekend.